This is the 46 of 46 Podcast Summit Sessions, where we'll talk all things Adirondack, backcountry, and beyond. From high peak stories and adventures to trail tips and tricks, we'll dive deep into the heart of these mountains and the people who passionately climb them. Adirondack maps and spruce traps, bushwhacks and backpacks. It's all here on the 46 of 46 Summit Sessions. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Summit Sessions here on the 46 of 46 podcast. Today's episode is about one trail and one trail only, the Northville Placid Trail, a 138-mile through hike here in the Adirondacks that traverses some of the most wild and remote wilderness in the park. And while the Adirondacks are better known for the high peaks and the hundreds of mountain trails or the unlimited amount of paddling opportunities in the thousands of lakes and rivers that exist here in the park, the Northville Placid Trail offers backpackers of all kinds an experience of a lifetime as they walk one continuous trail from Northville to Lake Placid. Some background, the trail was started in 1922 and completed in 1924. It was the first project undertaken by the newly formed Adirondack Mountain Club, funded primarily by George Pratt, who was also the first president of the ADK Mountain Club. Pratt saw a large value in having a major hiking route here in the heart of the Adirondack Park, and the reason the trail goes from Northville to Lake Placid was due solely to trailhead convenience and accessibility, since both Northville and Lake Placid had regular train service back in the early 1920s. Fast forward to 1927, the trail was donated to the state and it's now a maintained trail by the DEC with lots of help from the Adirondack Mountain Club and many volunteers. The thru-hike typically takes backpackers anywhere from one to two weeks to complete and is filled with lean-tos throughout, making it a great trail to thru-hike here in the ADK. My guest tonight is here to talk all about her experience thru-hiking this infamous trail in August of 2019. She completed the hike in eight days without a resupply. Oh, and she did it solo too, by the way. She's a nurse, an EMT, and she lives here in the Adirondacks. Her name is Danielle Roots, and tonight we're going to go through her entire hike. All eight days, day by day, start to finish. So if you're planning to hike this trail, I suggest you get out your map and follow along as Danielle takes us from Northville to Lake Placid. Danielle, welcome to the show, and thanks for coming on the 46 of 46 podcast. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm quite excited to hear about this trail in particular since it's on my it's on my list for this summer. So I think this will be a very enlightening conversation for me. So tell me about your background. How'd you get into hiking and the outdoors in general? How'd you get interested in the Adirondacks? And just give me a little background about yourself. Sure. Um, so I grew up in Grafton or Petersburg, New York, which is in Rensselaer County. And I spent a lot of my time hanging out outside, playing outside, building forts, exploring the land behind my father's house. And he was always very into camping and like primitive skills and stuff like that. So I became really interested in that. I I always kind of hiked us outside, but never really took on any like big mountains and or any long trails for that matter. I really just kind of stuck to what I knew. Um, And as I grew older, I became aware of the Adirondacks and the high peaks and I started to hike some of those and that's basically how I ended up here. So now at what point did you say I'm going to hike the Northville Placid Trail you know it's 138 miles it's a monster trail where did you get the idea to do that? So I got the idea kind of just after I hiked a few of the high peaks I just stumbled across some information on the internet about the Northville Placid Trail and how it basically was a through hike of the Adirondack Mountains. Uh, It was 2017 when I first was actually planning to hike the trail and I had it all planned down and I was ready to just get started. Um, About two weeks or two days before I was about to start, I saw the weather forecast for my entire trip was just all rain. So I just backed out. I was like, maybe this isn't the best time for me. And I just continued to do some other smaller hikes and I did some more high peaks. I spent some time in the whites in Maine and then I revisited the Northville Placid Trail in uh, uh, 2019. 
All right, cool. That that must have been quite the bummer. You know, you probably did so much planning, and then a couple of days before you had to pull out. Though I would have too. Um, you know, why why put yourself through that sort of a uh, that sort of hell if you don't have to, and you can kind of do it another time if the weather is going to be atrocious. Absolutely, and the Northville Plaza Trail tends to have kind of a reputation for being rough as far as just varying terrain, swamp lands, and I also just knew that, like, if I was to have seven days of rain nonstop, it would just really kill my mood and make it so much harder for me, especially being a new hiker and have never had a through hike before in my entire life. It, I think it would have just kind of bad, been a bad, bad, the excuse me, a bad experience. Sure, sure. I, I cannot blame you there. So now what was your preparation like as you prepared for it? So basically you planned your hike out in 2017, put the whole thing on hold, and then you tackled it in 2019. So I guess you probably did most of your planning in 2017 with maybe like tweaking things as it, you know, last year. So what was your planning like? How did you go about figuring out what your, how many days it was going to take you, you know, roughly, or what was your goal and um, where you wanted to stay each night? How did you figure that out for yourself? All right. So I had, um, I had the map um, in 2017 and I also had a it, like a trail log that the Northville Placid Trail Traptor put on their website, which is kind of like a play-by-play, -play, what to expect, um, mileages between um, some locations like lean-tos and mile markers, I guess you could say. And so I had that. So I kind of had an idea from then. And then I've also just talked to other people who had hiked the trail and asked them how long did it take them and then also kind of like taking it into account, like what kind of hiking do they do when they're not on longer trails? Like, are they pushing 30 mile days in the high peaks? Like what, what is their skill level to kind of in a way kind of compared to me? Uh, like I, I did do some high peaks and I wasn't in like the most immaculate of shape. Like I don't run ultra marathons or anything like that, but I knew that I wanted to finish at least um, in eight days, but I gave myself a 10 day grace period just so that I could, have a day or two if I needed it. Sure, that makes perfect sense. Now, what made you decide to go solo? Or was it just kind of a, no one's here to come with me, so I'm going to go do it? Why'd you go solo? I just wanted to, I guess, feel like I could do something big on my own. I, I was going through a lot of anxiety in that point in my life and the year or two leading up to this. And I always felt like I always waited on somebody else to do something with me. Like if I wanted to go explore somewhere, I always, you know, felt the need to reach out to a friend and be like, do you want to do this hike with me? Or do you want to camp here with me? And it was always relying on somebody else. And for me, this trail was a good place to figure out, like, can I rely on myself? Because it felt like for a long time, I wasn't giving myself that opportunity to show myself that I can take on something alone and be successful. So that was, that was a huge thing for me. And that's really the reason why I chose to go solo. And you were very successful. So that worked out very well. It was, it was great. <laughs> I totally recommend it for anybody. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. With the, with the appropriate amount of, uh, of homework being done beforehand, of course. Uh, what is Absolutely. the trail like out there as far as how well is it marked and easy to navigate or difficult to navigate. I'm sure there's some spots that might be, but in general, in your opinion, how well is the trail marked? How many trail markers are out there? In some sections, there were so many blue markers that it felt like it was excessive, excessively mm -hmm. marked in, in such a an area that the trail was very well defined. And then in some areas, I probably didn't see a, a trail marker for like a quarter mile or so. Um, but then I was also kind of following a pretty well-defined trail. I would say that I only had a couple of times where I had to stand and just look around for something blue for maybe a minute or two, but you know, and like, and that's the thing, like if you don't see a trail marker and if you feel even for a second that you might've stepped off the trail, just stop and look like, don't, don't frantically start walking around, you know, just stand and look because sometimes in your line of sight, you will see a blue, a blue marker or any marker that you're looking for. So that was just kind of like something that I tried to keep in mind. Like if when they were sparse, um, which didn't seem to be too often, but I did run into that a few times that they were kind of spread out. 
Cool. So you probably I did. didn't get lost at any points then. No, I didn't get, I get, I did not get turned around at all. Um, yeah, I just kind of, I, I would say the blue mountain lake area was, was the area that I think was the trickiest and everyone was telling me the blow down, beware of the blow down. And I had no problem with the blow down. I really didn't know what the fuss was about, about the blow down. You see a couple of trees that are knocked down on the trail. You walk around the trees and get back on the trail. It for me, it wasn't a huge thing. I know that you do, like, as you're continuously walking around trees throughout your day, that you do tack on that extra mileage. But essentially, you're still on the trail as long as you're keeping that marker in sight. Sure. Very cool. So now, before we get started, what was what's in your pack? What did you bring? Uh, what, did your, what did your gear look like? So my gear wasn't ultralight at all. Um, I had a 48-liter Osprey Kestrel, bright orange also for safety. And I just love the color. Um, and I would say that like in my pack, I had my MSR fly light too, which is a an ultralight tent. They say it's one pound, nine ounces. It's like a lean to shape and you use your trekking poles to prop it up. It's not freestanding. Um, but some important things that I think were absolutely key in my trip were my anchor battery pack. Uh, it's a 20, thousand milliamp hours um and it charged my iphone and my garment that i took with me seven times over which was cool. really nice cool um it's important things that i also brought with me were propel electrolyte packets um you're going to go through water like crazy um, at least when i did i did it in august so it was very humid i was going through water like like just so much water so i really found that having extra electrolytes with me in a like a lighter format was super super handy I, I know a lot of people like to use the no, the noon or none tablets noon and those yeah turn, i'm a huge yeah. noon guy myself right and they're and they're kind of heavy and sure. in my opinion so i i use the packets they're pretty light and uh i think that fuel is is more more important than anything having mm -hmm. good fuel will will get you from one point to the next so what did you bring for food and i'd say i know you didn't do it you had no resupply so you had everything with you from the start oh, yeah so uh, what were you eating each day? So when I packed out all of my food, I knew that I wanted to take at least 10 days worth of food. And I tried to pack at least 3,000 to 3,500 calories. Um, I wasn't like super, super like strict to the calorie kind of a thing. I really just kind of did a general estimate because I knew it was going to be flying through calories like nobody's business. So I tried to um, pack like anything that was densely packed with nutrients and calories that also wasn't very heavy. So my go-tos were... Uh, the Idahoian dehydrated mashed potatoes, some ramen noodles. I brought a big bag of Cheetos with me, and those rode on the top of my pack, like between my pack and my neck. That was my thing. And I had a little piece of duct tape that I just like, you know, rolled the top down and stuck it shut. So that was my thing. I would just like hike along and grab my pack, uh, my Cheetos off my pack, and just start munching on those. And it was a light form of food that was super comforting too sure and sure another thing i brought well actually a friend of mine brought gave to me i should say is the dried mango um you can get those at trader joe's or even aldi's which is super sweet and just i mean they're heavier but i i loved having something sweet and something really easy and accessible to chew on while i was going um it's nice having some emotional food as well when you're yeah. putting yourself through uh, what you're doing, especially when you're by yourself. Oh, yeah. And I did a whole lot of emotional eating. Like, it definitely wasn't sunshine and rainbows. I, I definitely let out a couple of solid F-bombs and mm -hmm. cried a couple of times towards the end, especially just from being tired. But, yeah, having some emotional comforting food is definitely really good for anybody, male or female. I think it's very important. Um, I would agree. Yeah. I, I think – something that I was something that I wish that I brought more of that even even with weight involved would have been tortillas shells and the tuna fish packets okay sure when I got to West Canada Lake Wilderness I was absolutely shot mentally and physically and I had like this one tuna packet that I was just kind of holding off from because I was like I know I'm gonna need this probably in the middle of this trip and I waited and I waited and I finally had it in West Canada Lakes and it just like instantly perked me right up. Like having the protein and that like those carbs were just everything to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So you've, you, yeah, speaking of, of protein, so we know you had Cheetos, 